Okay, so, so you got you uh, cut your teeth. Sounds like you enjoyed yourself working for the Sun. Yeah, because it was nice to do, and they threw the money at you. You could not enjoy it. So and then, well, I, while I was at the Sun, uh, the Sporting Life got in touch and said, we are advertising two jobs as sub-editor. It's early 81. Would you apply for one? And uh, I duly did. I went and saw Ozzy Fletcher, who was editor of their life for a million years, um, and who lived on his nerves and about 100 cigarettes a day. But it was a, but it was a good fellow, quite remote, but quiet, quite gentle fellow, a bit of steel to him, editors tend to. Um, and I went to have an interview with Ozzy, and he sort of asked me a few inane questions, um, and said, well, can you start the second week of March? And I said, well, I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Fletcher, and I can't, because the third week of March is Cheltenham, but I'll start after Cheltenham. And he looked a bit old-fashioned at me, he said, all right, go on. So um, that should have been a good qualification. <laughs> I wasn't going to miss Cheltenham. I haven't missed a day at the festival since I was 19, I don't think. God knows how I got the time off in those early days, but I managed it. So was it actually working, going into the office every day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and people will giggle, my colleagues now, because they always say I do absolutely nothing, but for a number of years, a good 10 years, I worked pretty well all hours at the life and the weekender and um, climbing up the ladder. Uh, because in those days I entertained hopes of of editing the paper one day. Um, and it was a bit like a holiday camp, <laughs> the life. It was, it was old Fleet Street, you know, plenty of us, and people would have a lunch and might come back, or certainly went out in the evening and might not come back. And it was the days of hot metal and the print unions. That was a hard, difficult side. Mm. There were some absolute so and so's involved there. Now, I, I first became aware of you would have been in about 1983 when I used to buy The Weekender. Yes. And you shared a page with Geoffrey Bernard. And if I remember rightly... Well, I certainly was in the paper with Geoffrey, yeah. Lot of, if, and that's why memory says, well, I remember you being, if I could be wrong, but on the, you know, in a similar sort of style. W w did you spend a lot of time with him? No, but I did interview him. Uh, I was set... I, I was sent to go and see him at the coach and horses in Soho and everything. Um, and to try and chat him up into working for the weekend. And I think you said afterwards, he, sort of, he was surprised nobody drowned that afternoon. I had quite a good head for him those days. Um, but after he'd had 25 lime and vodkas or vodka lime and whatever else he put in, uh, he came to work for us, yeah. Um, and he was the established wit of the game um, and popular and he was very much in his prime still. Um, I didn't see a lot of him, no, because, you know, he was in Soho all hours of the day and night, um, leaping in and out of Betty shops and beds. He was good at that. <laughs> so when did you start frequenting press rooms on race courses? Well, it's kind of hard to remember. I suppose I came to notice writing in the weekend because it was it was light-hearted, Mickey-taking, slightly different stuff, um, and it wasn't Bernard sub Bernard. He had he had his way of writing, and I had mine, and it was very light-hearted, and people liked it. Um, oh, when I first started frequenting the press, I suppose it must have been by the late eighties, yeah. And there would have been some big characters. In oh, the God, they were sort of full of enormous characters. Um, and, yeah, in those days, journalists drank on course. There was alcohol in the press boxes. You haven't found that for the last ten years, thank goodness. Um, and, yeah, there were some massive characters, massive characters. And, of course, all those days, it was it was phoned through. Um, it was a, that was the way it got through. You phoned it through from the high schools. And somebody in the office, the copy takers, would take it all down. <coughs> Excuse me. And copy takers were legends in themselves. You know, you, 
somebody would come on from Anfield on a Saturday just after they'd scored, the boot scored a third goal, and the guy in the copy would say, what noise in the background, can you get me to shut up a bit? I mean, do you try and get the cops shut up three near <laughs> up this Saturday afternoon? I imagine it must have been quite daunting, the press rooms in those days. On reflection, I think, I think it probably was, because the, the big beasts of the jungle, you know, they did their own thing and they... Yeah, they not going to pay any attention to some little squit, but I was never treated with anything but encouragement. Um, I mean, getting into the game originally, you know, you used to write to people like Peter Sullivan, Richard Bearline, the great Guardian racing correspondent. Um, you wrote to all those people who just said there are no jobs, but keep trying, and that was... So once you're, but once you're in, you're in. Um, in terms of the pressure being daunting, to me, it was just another establishment. And I'd spent all my life up to them fighting establishments. Um, and the jockey club were my sort of arch target because I thought they had to go. Um, it took me many years to recognise that they had qualities. I mean, they knew nothing about business, we knew everything about horses. And now we've got people who know nothing about horses and everything about business. Do you think they'll find a happy medium then? No. No. Right. Um, certainly down the road of racing politics. I used to get very firebrandish about it when I was young. Everyone regards me as sort of a, a figure, a sort of establishment conservative figure. I've never been either of those things. And um, I used to sort of kick against any system I could see. Um, because, of course, I knew everything and nobody else knew anything at all. It's like that sign people have on their walls, you know, uh, ask a teenager while they're still a teenager and know everything. So how broadcasting came along? Uh, how did that come along? I did a racing club evening at Cheltenham and in the audience, it was the first one I'd done, uh, among the audience uh, was Andrew Franklin, one of the great figures in racing over the last few decades, a man who gave life to Channel 4 racing and ran it for 25 years or so. And afterwards he said, oh, McCurick goes away in the, the autumn. Um, would you like to come review the newspapers? Um, and I said, yeah, yeah, I said, yeah I'd love to. Um, never gave it an old moment's thought. This was, I think, probably was in February, March. Typical Andrew planning decades ahead. Um, and then I think it must have been August, I was at home, and phone rang and I was talking about it in the kitchen with the wife and uh, I said, you know, I don't think I don't think I can be bothered. I didn't quite put that I said, I think it's really me, television, everything, you know, blah blah blah. Um, and put the phone down, but it, it was all very civil. And Francis, my wife, said, Who's that? I said it was at Andrew Franklin, Channel Four wants me to do a bit on that. She, said, you, she never got cross. I mean she had every reason, but she never got cross. Well, pick up the phone now and say, you made a mistake and you love to do it. So I did. And I started doing uh, newspaper reviews. I think started at Newcastle, Fighting Fifth, BTS um, And I, it, I thought it was absolutely terrifying. Uh, we have hold these bits of paper. And I was shaking with nerves, not as some people probably assume nowadays, uh, the effects of many years of dissipation. Um, but I found it terrifying. But they were just so, just a good bunch to work for and with, um, in front of camera, behind the camera. Just, it was a joy to work with such enthusiastic, civil, and it was funny, the whole thing was funny and yeah you got on some fair old scrapes of doing that as well. Come on then. Oh all sorts of things. There were too many late nights which are bad when you're starting at six in the morning when we have half five or something and things like locking yourself out your hotel room in St Helens or somewhere at three in the morning with no clothes on and things like that. Nightmare. Absolutely. I won't go through the details of how I got back here. 
but uh, I don't think I was the only person able to do it at the time. But, uh, I'm sure people would be glad to hear that that's what it was like. So, because for most people, those were the golden years of racing TV. I think and the I chemistry. I, I, I think I think they had a very strong identity. Uh, I think Andrew was a a genius at making programmes. He set the agenda that lasts this day for how racing is covered. He made it much more interesting. He could see the interests of the public first and foremost ahead of the television companies themselves. Um, I don't know if it was a golden age. I think it was, it, it certainly wasn't a tarnished one. And I think at its best, um, it was an enormous amount of fun for the viewer. And in those days, the, the morning line had a, a very considerable viewership of which around 40, 45% had no interest in racing whatsoever. But it was one of the first times you could sit and watch some semi-intelligent people um, sitting around taking the mickey out of each other. Yeah, it's a big uh, characters there, didn't you? Big personalities. Oh, God, yes, absolutely. You know, the critics and Frankens and Jim McGrath. I mean, I'd know Max. Mac was chief reporter at the Post in '81, at the Life in '81 when I joined, and he was an enormous figure. And I think one of the most underrated figures in British racing in the last two or three decades, because he was a brilliant reporter. He was the only person ever from our game. I, mean, I win a sort of in-house prize every now and again, but he was reporter of the year for the country, you know, and got his award from uh, Mrs. Thatcher and things like that. He did some major stories. Stories came into him he was already a very high-profile character. And you, if you got in the back of a taxi um, and they said, oh, what you do I do? The first question was, oh, do you know John McCurry? I mean, he was more, more people could name John McCurry than they could the Home Secretary at the time, or even the Prime Minister. Mind you, not many Home Secretaries look like Mac or sound like him. And he's, he's not, he wouldn't pretend to be the force he was, but he had a wonderfully quick, um, questing mind and was always thinking two or three steps down the road and I admired him greatly I mean I won't say that he doesn't drive me insane on occasions or um, and he developed a tendency he would have walked over his mother's face in hobnail boots to be in front of a camera by some stage but it, don't forget what a crusading force he was for the punter. And of course he made every programme different because he could just suddenly say anything. And you'd have Frank you could hear Franklin screaming in his ear, Shut up, Mac. Shut up, Mac. And he, he just totally ignore it. Um, and then it would all go off. Once he'd come off it, why didn't you do it? He was a team player, but he won't get him. He wasn't going to be a sort of nameless midfielder. He wanted the ball to his feet and kick it where he wanted it. That must have been quite a hair-raising experience for a producer in that live show. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, it is live. Never, I think people are so much better at it these days. You, I mean, I don't have either of the specialist channels because I sit and watch it all day. Um, uh, and there are other things in the world than horse racing. But when you do see it, you, the knowledge of these people, just unbelievable. I mean, they might not know, um, you know, who, who is Lawrence Secretary, but they can tell you what finished six and made in the Pontefract four months ago. I'm not sure it's entirely brilliant talent, but it makes the television. You, there's nothing they don't know.